Gospels are often depicted as unreliable, a collection of exaggerated stories drawn from the inaccurate recollections and downright inventions of early Christians, uh, written down long after the time of Jesus. But in this video, we're going to look at a little bit of the evidence. Uh, we're going to see that the Gospels are reliable, that they were written only a short time after the events they describe, and that they make use of eyewitness testimony. So subscribe, press the, the notify bell button, and off we go. The key questions are, first of all, who wrote the Gospels? Uh, was it, it Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Or was it a, a set of later writers who were making use of their names? Second question, when were the Gospels written? Uh, was it soon after the events of Jesus' life, or was it much later? And finally, did the disciples use eyewitness testimony in what they were writing? So we're going to look at those questions in, in more detail in some later videos, uh, but now I have historian John Botton here, who is going to show us some of the evidence in brief. So, John, uh, how do historians try to establish the truth of what happened in the past? Well, I don't use this. Uh, one of the things which frustrates me as a historian is how much of the narrative about these questions, these very important questions we're looking at this evening, has been dictated by all sorts of strange sources, not least going back to the early 2000s, Dan Brown's Da Vinci Code. And in that and other publications since then, uh, Dan Brown put into the mouth of his uh, characters the statement you can see there, the Bible is a product of man, not of God, and history has never had a definitive version of the Bible. Now, as a historian, that, that really uh, uh, irritates me because in Dan Brown's book, there's no, not much sign of any historical method. And historical method is important when we look at these important questions. Uh, this is how historians work or, or certainly should work. The whole point of historical research is to look carefully at the evidence which is available and then to piece it together in a way which enables to establish as nearly as we can what actually happened. Now, had we got any and not been 2000 years after the event, we would first of all have been looking for oral evidence, but obviously all the people concerned are long, long since dead. So all the evidence we're going to see is, is, is really documentary evidence. And it falls into two categories. First of all, there's primary evidence. Primary evidence is basically evidence for those who were there, who were eyewitnesses of the events or, or, or uh, speeches or whatever else, the teachings they describe. And um, in general, primary evidence is regarded as, as good, as superior. Secondary evidence is written by people who weren't actually at the events they describe, but if their research is really well done, then actually secondary evidence can pull together a lot of primary evidence in a very effective way. And it's like detective work. Historians rely on evidence they try and piece together the past. Now, when we come to the, um, to, to the, the, the New Testament manuscripts and evidence, the documentary evidence we have, the really striking thing for historians is what a huge amount of evidence there is in, in terms of volume. Now, we're not going to spend very long on this table, but, but you can study it if you wish and pause it and look at it at your leisure. But you'll see right over in the left hand corner is the number of manuscripts for the New Testament Greek manuscripts. And you can see it's well over 5000. Uh, New Testament manuscripts in all languages, you can see, well, uh, 23,000 plus a huge number. If you look at the other um, works shown on this chart, you can see there's some very famous things. Homer's Iliad, Herodotus is supposed to be the father of history, uh, Josephus, the famous Jewish historian. But you can see that the number of manuscripts in virtually all of them is very, very small compared to the number which we have of the New Testament. Uh, in terms of Greek manuscripts. So that's the first thing. In, in terms, from a historian's point of view, there's a lot more to look at and to consider 
than there is of almost any other, well, certainly any other ancient work uh, from this time period. And one of the things which is interesting is if you look at all these various manuscripts of the Gospels and the rest of the New Testament, when you, you've therefore got an awful lot of material which you can compare one copy with another. Uh, and one of the remarkable things is that there's a lot of exact congress. Now, what that means is they are word for word the same looking across the manuscripts. So in Matthew's Gospel, Arlen and Arlen uh, quoted in, in that fine source Wikipedia, which is often very useful, um, they reckon 60% for Matthew, 45% for Mark, 57% for Luke, 52% for, for John. When I looked at that, I thought, well, that's not particularly high, but what they're talking about is exact congruence. And when they talk about the variance, the, the things which aren't exactly the same in every single manuscript, in the vast, vast majority of cases, they are only slight variations of grammar or spelling, might be just one letter in a name or all sorts of things like that. And the remarkable thing is that um, only that they reckoned Ireland and Ireland that only 0.1% or 0.2% have any significance whatsoever. And they also go on to state they don't think it's got much uh, doctrinal significance, serious significance. Uh, that's very interesting. And I know, John, that you're going to be preparing a book on all this. And I know you've done quite a lot of research. I don't know whether you want to come in here for a moment with anything about your research. Well, right, yes, although the book I'm writing is more to do with who wrote the Gospels than uh, the manuscripts of the Gospels. But what I think you, you, you found is that there is that this is a, a fairly uh, good um, figure to show us how much how, when we compare all this huge quantity of material, yeah. the variations between the copies are very, very small. And that's it's a, I mean, it's not a book I'm writing. This is this is something that, that uh, I had my students coding up manuscripts for five years. And okay. when we got a computer analysis of it at the end, we found that was fewer than uh, a thousand words that were in in any kind of doubt out of about 180,000 words for the New Testament. Which is a pretty good percentage, it must come pretty close to the percentage. A pretty good percentage, but I'm afraid it won't appear in my the book I'm writing at the moment. Right. <laughs> However, it's useful to know, so uh, that confirms, I think, what we've been seeing here. Now, the, the other thing, we, again, we're not going to spend long on this one because we've spent a very long time discussing this. Uh, this is about the dates of the earliest fragments and manuscripts of various ancient writings. And again, if you look on the extreme left, you can see New Testament Greek. And the little blue, the very tiny blue column there, shows the period between the events or the, 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 the expected date of writing, we'll talk about dates a bit further on, and the actual um, first fragments we have. And you'll notice that in the case of the New Testament, <clears throat> in Greek and indeed other, lang other languages as well, it's a very short period of time, especially when you compare it to most of the others. Uh, so you see Caesar's Gallic Wars, quite a long period between when Caesar's writing, sometime around 55, 54 BC, that sort of period, and the time when we have the first fragments of, uh, of his, his, his work. So this is in the, the red columns or the orange red columns are the complete manuscripts. So you can see that by 225, the print's a bit small, I think that's right, and if I'm reading it correctly, uh, we, we've got uh, complete manuscripts, plenty, plenty of them. The, the, the manuscripts of the gospel come from pretty close to the events they record, much closer to the events than a lot of other ancient works. Right, let's move on because we want to get to these questions. So who wrote these Gospels? Was it Matthew, Mark, Luke or John? Or was it uh, some writers later on who borrowed the names? What can we find out about this? Well, first of all, we can look at the early fathers, the early church fathers they usually described. Now, these are some of the early Christians who wrote down uh, uh, various things and made reference, a number of them, to the, these uh, early Gospels. Um, we're not going to look at all of these, there are quite a few, but Justin Martyr, there he is, quite early on, he doesn't name the Gospels by names Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, but he refers to the memoirs of the Apostles. So by his time, sometime around 120 Christian uh, common era, um, that they were there. 
Irenaeus uh, talks about them writing a bit later, and he actually talks about Gospels as being from Matthew the Apostle, Mark the companion of Peter, Luke the companion of Paul, and John the Apostle of Jesus. So he, he recognized from that pretty early date the, these Gospels by name. And Papias, writing a bit earlier, refers to writing by Matthew, which may be the Gospel, but he also refers to Mark's account of the life of Jesus as being sourced from the Apostle Peter, and we'll look again at that in a few minutes' time. So how can we prove that these Gospels were written by the people whose names are attached to them? Well, Matthew is the hardest to prove, but when we look at it, it's pretty obvious that it's written by somebody who's familiar with the tax system. Now, we know from the Gospels that Matthew was a tax collector, so that fits. Uh, those who studied the gospel care carefully uh, point out that it's somebody with an orderly mind. I, I hesitate to offend accountants, but I hope you will see the point. Uh, he, he was good at organizing information material and organizes it in a particular way. Uh, the last one there is interesting. He refers to silver and gold much more, 28 times in all, than any of the, of the other gospels, only five times elsewhere. So although most of that is a bit circumstantial, it still helps us to have a, a good deal of confidence that Matthew is the right person and that this is his gospel. Now, when we come to Mark, I, I like this one because this is, this is a very good line of evidence, isn't it? So uh, Eusebius, writing in the fourth century, uh, tells us in his writing that Papias in the first second century, very, very soon actually after the time of the apostles, and probably um, uh, still alive at the time when the apostle John was still alive, uh, says that John, the gospel writer John the Elder, told Papias that John Mark wrote this gospel and that he based it on apostle Peter's reminiscences. So that's a pretty good line of what in, in the art world you would call provenance. Uh, going right back to the earliest days and leading us straight back uh, from fourth century writers uh, right through to, to Mark and indeed to the Apostle Peter. And there are lots of other early church writers who, who have similar comments about Mark. So I think we can be pretty clear on this one. It looks pretty certain that we've got the right name and the right person as the author of this gospel. Uh, Luke is, is a good one, really. There, there are lots of references from the early church um, uh, to Paul's companion, Luke, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian, Origen, Origen and, and others. They all list him as the author. Uh, we know pretty much for certain, well, we do because it's quite, quite evident from the text, that Luke and the Acts of the Apostles were both written by the same person. In Paul's letters, he refers to Luke having been with him on various occasions, and we're told he was a doctor. So there's a lot of evidence, including a lot of eternal evidence, including, interesting enough, when Luke describes when he was actually with the Apostle Paul in the Acts of the Apostles especially, uh, and when he, we can tell when he wasn't because he talks about we and us in the former case, and obviously them and he in the latter. Uh, so this is pretty good evidence. Um, we seem to be on pretty good ground there. John, the apostle, becomes uh, very close to revealing himself. At the very end of the gospel, well, indeed, right through it, he talks about, on numerous occasions, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And it's pretty clear from what the text says that this disciple whom Jesus loved uh, was the person who wrote the gospel. Now, you can see the quotation there. This is when uh, Jesus had been resurrected. It comes from John chapter 21. But Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following him, them. Sorry, This was the one who leaned back against Jesus at supper and said, Lord, who's going to betray you? So this is a disciple very, very close to the Lord Jesus Christ. Actually, the, 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 uh, what colloquially called the Last Supper, uh, right next to him, and who had asked Jesus, or who is going to betray you when the Lord Jesus Christ said, one of you is going to betray me. It, at the very end of the gospel, 
there is a what appears to be a note from the scribe who who was uh, writing down this gospel as john dictated it to him say this is the one who bears witness and we know his testimony is true so that's pretty good evidence uh, it, it seems to be very close to a self-identification so where does this leave us with the primary and secondary evidence well matthew and john as disciples apostles of the lord jesus christ are for the most part giving us primary evidence they're telling us about things most of which they were there for um, uh, obviously some of them they weren't such as the birth of jesus and the visit of the wise men for example in matthew's gospel uh, but they are would be are counted as primary evidence and therefore they are useful on those grounds and Mark and Luke are secondary evidence. Why is that? Well, because Mark uh, seems to have based his uh, gospel largely on what the Apostle Peter told him. And Luke, we know, uh, was very careful to put together all the evidence he could get from numerous eyewitnesses. I, I like to think of Luke as the patron saint of historians because he he tells us how careful he was, uh, you know, he says he, he tried to get together an accurate uh, uh, record of what Jesus had done, because his patron Theophilus wanted a good account of the life of Jesus. So even on an uh, ordinary basis, uh, Luke is, is a wonderful historian on what we can tell of his writing. Now, at this point, we come up against a problem because some of the people who are so skeptical about this uh, will say to us, well, hang on a bit. Weren't these gospel writers, you know, pretty ordinary people? And Mark's a tax collector. Sorry, Matthew's a tax collector. Um, uh, Luke, well, he's a doctor. We'll come to him in a minute. John, well, of course, he was just in a fishing firm on the Sea of Galilee. How come they could all write such good Greek? Nearly all the New Testament, well, virtually all the New Testament gospel manuscripts from the earliest days are in Greek. So were Matthew, Mark, Luke and John educated enough to write in Greek? That's the question we've now got to look at. Easiest one to come to a conclusion of is Luke. Luke was a doctor, he highly educated. Pretty much all the medical texts of his day would, were in Greek. And some of them, like the writings of Galen, were still in use long, long after this time, right into the Middle Ages. Uh, but the originals were all in Greek. He was probably not a Jew. Um, there's some debate as to where exactly he came from. It might have been Philippi or somewhere around there, which was in Macedonia, in Greek, the Greek part of the Roman Empire. His gospel is dedicated to a group of men called Theophilus, a very Greek name. And indeed, it looks quite likely that Greek was his first language. So I don't think there's any doubt about Luke, an educated man, all educated men in the Roman Empire, particularly in that part of the Roman Empire, and doctors especially would be able to understand Greek. What about Matthew? Well, Matthew, we know, um, was a tax man. He, he, he had his tax station, his tax position, um, probably somewhere near the quay on, on the lakeside in Capernaum. And therefore, he was kind of a civil servant. So he worked for Herod Antipas. And it's pretty clear, I think, from this, he would have needed to speak Greek. In addition, because of his position, his tax base at Capernaum, Galilee, uh, there there was a constant stream of people coming through. It was on the main route from north to south. And uh, you would need to speak Greek. And in any case, the area around Capernaum uh, was known uh, from after the destruction of North and Northern Kingdom centuries earlier, uh, to have a lot of Greek speaking people, uh, uh, people who wouldn't necessarily uh, know the more Jewish languages of Aramaic and uh, Hebrew. What about Mark? Well, I could, probably could. Um, there's all, all the evidence which we have from the Gospels itself, and indeed a little bit from the Acts, suggests that Mark came from a fairly well to do family. It is suggested on the basis of some of the things the early church fathers say that he may have written his gospel for non-Jews in Rome. And again, Greek would have been the right language to use for that. 
because it was the common language in the whole of the Eastern Empire. Almost everywhere you went in the Eastern Empire, because there are lots and lots of different people with different local languages, but if you could speak Greek, you could carry on your business, you could converse, you could get by pretty well. This is a strange notion to us in our country of England, because we are not very good at this. We haven't got a very good notion of having a good second language. But you will know if you've ever been to places like Norway, most of the people in Norway speak Norwegian, but they also speak pretty good English. Uh, and it, similarly, in the Eastern Roman Empire, most people spoke Greek. And of course, Greek was particularly needed because the, the, John Mark traveled with Paul and Barnabas at least at the beginning of their first journey. What about the Apostle John? Well, um, was he a hick from the sticks? Hardly. Um, they ran a family fishing business. It was sufficiently well to do to have hired servants. We know that John was quite well known uh, by the, the, the temple um, officials and perhaps even the high priest himself, because the family fish business uh, uh, evidently sold fish from Galilee up as far as Jerusalem, almost certainly also to the local Roman garrisons and to many others. And, and again, uh, you would need to speak Greek to be able to carry this business on successfully. Um, just to come to the last point there, we know that at the very end of his life, he was somewhere around Ephesus, again, a very Greek speaking part of the Roman Empire. Uh, again, good presumption that he, he spoke Greek. And you'll see I put in there, many of the Jews spoke Aramaic, which was the, uh, I suppose, the language of the common people. Uh, read some Hebrew because they were taught this in the synagogue schools and there they would learn the law of Moses and various other uh, Old Testament texts and they would be taught to read them in Hebrew and they knew Greek as their second language so again pretty clear I think that John would have also been able to speak Greek. There's a very interesting evidence um, from Jewish graves, which has been uh, examined, and you can see this comes from an article in the Biblical Archaeology Review in 1992. Because you would have thought that perhaps Jewish graves would have had inscriptions in Hebrew or Aramaic, but actually, when they were looked at closely, a large number were looked at over quite a period, covered quite a period of time. Uh, two out of three of the ones in Palestine and 40% of all the inscriptions in Jerusalem were not in Hebrew or Aramaic, but actually in Greek. Again, underlining the point, which I think we've now managed to establish pretty well and uh, evidenced by the quotation, which follows in the same article a bit further on, the first five centuries, the majority of Jews in Palestine spoke Greek. So that seems to I fairly firmly kick into touch the suggestion that the apostles, uh, those who wrote the Gospels, could not have possibly written Greek. Uh, it's clear they would have known Greek, they would have spoken Greek, and could have easily written Greek. The other thing which is interesting is that when you look at the um, available edition of the Bible, which was there in the uh, time of the apostles, the Septuagint version was the most common version, uh, the translation of the Old Testament, and of course it was in Greek. It's widely uh, referred to in the New Testament uh, and is quoted there most frequently in terms of Old Testament quotations. Just after the time of Jesus, when there were Hellenists Christians, these were actually Christians who were Jews, but probably couldn't speak Aramaic, the local language, and therefore needed to speak Greek and needed other people to understand them speaking Greek, because that was the language which they, they, they were used to. In passing, it's worth noticing uh, that this argument stretches out to what did Jesus, what was Jesus able to speak? Well, we know he could speak Aramaic. He uses some Aramaic expressions. Sometimes in the Gospels they explained uh, as though the readers of the Gospels probably wouldn't understand them otherwise. Um, he certainly would have spoken Hebrew because he went to the synagogue uh, school and would have been brought up to do that. And pretty clear when you come across him in the Gospels conversing with Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, Herod the king, Roman centurions, other people, 
uh, many of whom would have been Greek speakers rather than necessarily Aramaic speakers, um, that, that he could have spoken Greek. So there we are, that seems to be the situation. That doesn't seem to be a viable objection to the Gospels being written by the alleged writers, by the named writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. They were capable of writing Greek, it seems pretty clear when we look at the evidence carefully. So uh, we've, we've seen that the, the disciples could have written something in Greek, or at least they could have dictated it in Greek if they uh, weren't very good at writing it. Um, when were the Gospels written? It seems a, a very important question. Can we show they were written within living memory of the things they describe? Well, as you know, John, the, the, this, is, this has been the subject of a vast literature <laughs> and uh, continues to be. But it seems to me there's a fairly conclusive and fairly simple test which we can apply. Between 66 and 73 Common Era, uh, a disastrous event took place, and that event was the rebellion of the Jews against the Romans. Uh, it went very well to start with from the Jewish rebels' point of view, uh, but the end was absolute catastrophe because the temple, which actually had only recently been completed sometime around 65, 66, the, the archaeologists reckon, so it had hardly been finished. The temple which Herod the Great had started for them uh, was totally destroyed and the city was destroyed and the nation was effectively destroyed. So there was no more high priest, there was no more temple. The whole center of Jewish religion was destroyed. The nation was uh, uh, almost fatally damaged, it appeared. Um, but the curious thing is that when we look at the Gospels, you would have thought that had this event taken place before they were written, they would have made reference to it, particularly because the only reference which there are to this are prophetic ones. So in the prophecy given on the Mount of Olives by the Lord Jesus Christ to his disciples, there is a forecast, a, a prediction that this event will take place. And the Lord Jesus Christ even gives some indication on that occasion and at least one other to take place within a generation, normally around 40 years, of, of his, his uh, death and resurrection. Um, so apart from that, and, and you would have thought, wouldn't you, that if, if the event had actually taken place which fulfilled the prophecy, that the gospel writers would say, and this came true because I, I was there when Jerusalem was destroyed. But no, they, none of them actually mentioned it at all. But what they do do is they mention places there is a pool in Jerusalem called Siloam and things like this. Uh, places which were still plainly there when they were writing the Gospels, but which we know were pretty much wiped out by the destruction of Jerusalem after 70 CE. So this is um, a pretty convincing piece of uh, specific evidence. Now, there are lots of other arguments which could be gone into, and as the series goes on, uh, I'm sure there'll be more on this particular point. But what it suggests is the four Gospels were all finished before 66, or at least before the destruction of Jerusalem. And that means they were in living memory of the life, death and resurrection of Jesus, normally reckoned to be, the crucifixion of Jesus reckoned to be probably about 30 CE, uh, possibly a, a little bit later, but not much far from that, two or three years difference wouldn't, wouldn't make much difference. But within living memory of the events which they describe, and uh, therefore readily deniable by anybody who said, well, this isn't true. Uh, again, uh, as I mentioned, there's a huge literature on the subject of exactly when they were written. Um, Mark probably writing at a point where he would have been able to be with the Apostle Peter. It's possible that, that was in Rome or after he met Peter in Rome, we're not quite sure, but it's fairly clearly the case that Peter had a strong influence on what Mark wrote. Matthew's Gospel, quite difficult to predict exactly, uh, to, 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 to identify exactly when it was written. 5055 is probably the earliest, but certainly not later than 60 or, or 65 at the outset, at, at the outlier there. 
Luke's the one which is, we can get nearest to because we know when the Acts of the Apostles ends pretty clearly uh, because there's a one specific re reference in one of the Acts, of the, uh, one of the uh, chapters of the Acts of the Apostles about when the Apostle Paul was in Corinth. We can date it to a particular uh, proconsul called Gallio, and we know his dates from other sources. So that one looks pretty much as though it was 61 when the Acts of the Apostles were ended, and probably written when the Apostle Paul was in prison. Uh, first of all, briefly in Jerusalem, then laterally in Caesarea. John, we don't know exactly when, but again, the evidence appears to be that this was before the destruction of Jerusalem and the, the uh, end of the temple worship. Um, again, there will be more on this further on in the series, God willing. So, written by the people who say they're, they're, they're named for, um, written, it appears, from the evidence we can see, uh, pretty early on, so not a long time afterwards when memories have faded or things have got confused. And also, what about eyewitnesses? How much was this eyewitness evidence? Well, we've got a period of about 20 to 40 years after Jesus died and rose to life again. So as we said before, this is within living memory. It's not that far after. Um, it's things they would be able to recall. There are lots of details about customs and about people and about local geography and even the weather conditions on occasions, about locations in Galilee and in Jerusalem. Um, and we can find out from other sources this, this fits, this is, this, is, this, this is right for the time, uh, according to the other evidence we have. Um, th this is good. Um, it, 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 it uh, sits well with the other information we have from the time from archaeology and other writings. A lot of the Gospels contain interesting details which only an eyewitness would really have included. There's a few examples here. They're all from the Gospel of John, but you could go, go to other lists of others from other Gospel writers. Uh, Jesus went to wedding in Canaan in Galilee and turned water into wine and the number of water jars and indeed their size is specifically recorded. There's a man at the pool of Bethesda in Jerusalem and he's healed and the gospel writer John tells us he's been there for a very long time, I think it's 38 years it says. The name of the servant who Peter attacked in Gethsemane when Jesus was being arrested and Peter had sworn that he would protect him to the death. So he got out the sword he found somewhere and he struck out and he struck the high priest's servant and it says the servant's name was Malchus. After the resurrection, the number of fish caught by the disciples by the, in the Sea of Galilee, 153. So these are all interesting details which, which um, give credence to the notion that these were eyewitness accounts. The Gospel's also pretty honest about the failure of the disciples. You know, these are no rose tinted descriptions of a wonderful group of apostles of Jesus who did everything right and have wonderful faith and, and so on and so forth. In fact, we're often told they were quarreling, you know, they, we, we're given description of them following Jesus on the way from one place to another. And they're discussing who was the greatest, you know, I'm better than you, you know, that sort of thing. They're frequently reproached for their lack of faith. The Apostle Peter is particularly uh, picked out, well, picked out is perhaps a bit strong, but identified as having strenuously told Jesus that he wouldn't deny him even if he had to go and die with him. And then within a few hours, three times, denying him and saying he didn't even know him. He got nothing to do with him. So they're, they're far from what we call hagiographies. Hagiographies are sort of lives of saints which are, you know, pretty, um, uh, rose tinted halo ridden pictures of them um, and of course we've got in various gospels um, particularly the gospel of john uh, the as i say the person probably being dictated to by the apostle john and writing what john was saying down says this is the disciple who's bearing witness to these things and we know his testimony is true you know i i can tell you the person who I'm writing this down for, he's, he's, he's a reliable witness, he was there. There's another interesting one, I, I, I think this is really interesting. Um, 
Judas Iscariot was the disciple of Jesus who betrayed him and afterwards killed himself. And in the beginning of the Acts of the Apostles, the Apostle Peter says, look, we need to replace Judas uh, because we ought to have a full number of, of, of apostles to, for our next mission, which is to preach the gospel. And we better draw up a short list. And, and the criterion for the people on the short list is they must be people of, who were eyewitnesses of everything that Jesus had done from the time of John the Baptist right up to his death and resurrection. And so it's important to the gospel, says Peter, that these are eyewitnesses. This is, this is really important stuff. Now, the other question which arises, how did they remember the details? Well, there are some events in life which are unforgettable. Uh, those of you who are old enough to remember the, the Twin Towers disasters, what was it, about 20 years ago, I think it is this year, in fact, in a few days' time. Um, they, they uh, I can remember where I was when I first heard of it. And similarly, you know, other major disasters stick in the mind because they are so extraordinary. And many of the events the disciples witnessed were unforgettable. So, for example, they witnessed three specific occasions when Jesus raised people from the dead, the most dramatic of which was the raising of Lazarus in John chapter 11. And those events, they wouldn't forget in a, a hurry. These were amazing events. They were unforgettable. Uh, Luke, as I said, uh, my patron saint of historians, uh, tells us he talked to lots of witnesses. So he went round, probably while Paul was in prison in, in Caesarea, had the opportunity then to visit various places. He talked to people. He talked, no doubt, to as many of the disciples as he could meet, probably talked to Mary, the mother of Jesus, and as many other people as he could find. And he says, I've, I've talked to these people, and I can write an accurate report of the life of Jesus. I've, I've gathered the eyewitness evidence together. My record is secondary, but it's based on very good primary sources. The other factor, which of course we need to take into full account, is that the Lord Jesus Christ, on the night of his betrayal, when they were in the upper room, had told his disciples they would be helped to recall his words and deeds through the Holy Spirit by God, by, by God working through them. Holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, says the, the apostle uh, in describing how inspiration works. So they didn't solely have to rely on their memories. Uh, they were aided in this, that what Jesus had told them. Well, we're almost back to the beginning here, John, and uh, there's the question we started off with. Um, I have to say, as a historian, uh, the evidence seems to be pretty conclusive. You know, yes, it does appear these were written by the disciples. There's good evidence for this. They were close contacts of Jesus. Um, Yes, they were written soon after the events they describe. It wasn't hundreds of years later when things could have become grossly distorted. And yes, they were, I, they were in many cases eyewitnesses of the things which were recorded. They were there. And that was so important in uh, the accuracy of the Gospels. So there we are. I know you want to, people to do this, don't you, John, to sign up to the Gospel Online webinar. That's right. You you should, you should see uh, a, a, an address to the uh, right-hand side of your screen. Uh, we can't see it recording, but you should be able to see it when you, when you look at the, uh, the final product. And the series will explore the evidence in, in a lot more detail. So there'll be more on some of the things we've touched on, not had time to ex explore in full detail. And of course, the most important thing of all is to actually start reading the Gospels now. It always strikes me as a little sad that people make wild, well, wild is perhaps the wrong word, make statements about the Gospels and question their accuracy when they haven't actually read the Gospels, which is a shame. So it, it, it's too important to miss, isn't it? I love this passage. It comes from Second Peter. Do not follow cunningly devised fables. It's almost as though, well, Peter or perhaps the Holy Spirit anticipated our age. And people say, oh, no, you can't believe that. It's all just, just a lot of rubbish. No, says Peter, we didn't follow cunning devised fables. 
made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are eyewitnesses of his majesty. And what we want you to do, what we all should be doing, is finding out more about the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ, because in the Gospels there is the promise that he's coming back to the earth to set up God's kingdom and put our world to rights. And it certainly needs it, doesn't it? Right, thanks. And for those of you who are, are still uh, listening, if you want to tell us what you think of, of uh, what you've seen in the comments, uh, either below or down to the right, uh, please type away and let us know, and we'll uh, we'll take that into account as we carry on through the, this particular season of uh, videos.